Well, grace to you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How you doing today, Beacon Hill? You doing all right? Awesome, man. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks for my brother-in-law coming and leading worship with us today. Very blessed to have him. He led worship at his church and then came on over here. So uh, very blessed to have him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them up with me to Matthew chapter 14. We'll be studying verses 1 through 12. This morning, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring a copy of God's Word so you can follow along. Uh, if you don't have a copy of God's Word at home, please take it with you as our gift to you this morning. We will be strongly in having the Word open as it is preached. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome our online community under the direction of Jesse. This morning, I see her talking to everybody. We thank you so much for being there. And Jesse, get back here soon, all right? We miss you, all right? So we're, we're very thankful for her and everything that she does. Uh, as is custom, if you are able, we invite you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew 14, 1 through 12. By the way, this is a, a heavy passage this morning. Um, I, I looked at a lot of other sermons and they, they skipped over the sin. And you can't do that. You can't hide God's word. You got to preach all of God's word. So may God be glorified today. Matthew 14, 1 through 12. At the time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. This is John the Baptist, he told his servants. He's been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, chained him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Since John had been telling him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to kill John, he feared the crowd since they regarded John as a prophet. When Herod's birthday celebration came, Herodias' daughter danced before them and pleased Herod. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Although the king regretted it, he commanded that it be granted because of his oaths and his guest. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, buried it, and went and reported it to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you um, for today. We thank you um, for the gift of your word. And Lord, you call us to preach all of your word, not just the warm and fuzzy ones. So Lord, help us this morning just understand why you gave us this text and how you want us to respond to this text. This is your word and your word is profitable for teaching, correction, so that the man of God may be complete. So Lord, heal us where we're broken this morning. And your method of healing us is for us to repent so we can see you clearly. Lord, I pray that if someone here today doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I pray for the hearts of the hearers to be pierced by this message and make corrections in their life where they need to honor you. Lord, I pray that you would increase and I would decrease now and you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, Appealing to the Conscience. We're entering uh, Matthew chapter 14. A couple more years, we'll be done with Matthew. But uh, we walk right through scripture. But as we enter into Matthew chapter 14, C.J. Schofield rightfully calls these next 13 chapters the ministry of rejection. Jesus is being continually rejected and increasingly rejected at every single place that he goes. And you know what he does? He gathers his disciples up and he keeps preaching the kingdom. Church, let that be an example to us. Regardless how much this world rejects the message we have been given, we are to keep preaching Jesus. That's what we're called to do. We might be rejected 99 out of 100 times, but oh, that one makes it so worthwhile, doesn't it, church? Keep preaching Jesus. Last week, we saw him being rejected by resentful and jealous people in his hometown. This week, we see him being rejected by Herod the Tetrarchs, by killing John the Baptist. 
These stories are a painful reminder of the lost and broken world that we live in today. The first story that we talked about last week deals with a whole town that rejected Christ. Here it talks about a man who rejected Christ. The first deals with the treatment of Jesus himself. This week we deal with the treatment of the Messiah's forerunner. All he did wrong was stand up for Jesus. The first story deals with jealousy of Jesus' own community. This story deals with fear that a man had of other people. Behind it all is the selfish pride of the human heart. When I looked at scriptures, I wanted to share with you in Jeremiah 17, 19, it says the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? Do you understand the things that you do sometimes? Paul says, I do the very things that I hate. You want to please God, but your flesh is a fight every day. Do I have a witness in here? You fight it every day. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, exhorts us to guard our hearts above all else, for it is the source of life. Psalm 51.10 says he prays for restoration by asking God to create a clean heart in me and renew a steadfast spirit in me. I, I don't know about you, but I don't need to just do that occasionally. I need to do that continually. I need to ask God to create in me a clean heart. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my commands and carefully observe my ordinances. Only Jesus can clean a wicked and deceitful heart, church. Only Jesus can do that. This text this morning shows just how far the human heart and the wickedness of the human heart will go without Jesus. I mean, this story is so wicked and disgusting that Jerry Springer would have nothing to do with it. For those younger generation in here, Netflix executives would say they need something more conservative for their viewing audience. But at its core, it shows us just how wicked human are. When we look at Herod in here, it's not Herod the Great we're talking about. It's Herod the Tetrarch. Some call him Herod Antipas, but in this text this morning, we're just calling Herod to keep things straight. Herod and Herodias were both married, but not to each other. Matter of fact, Herodias was married to Herod's brother. So I want you to keep, if you, you're going to need like a notepad to keep all this together. All right. So Herod and Herodias were married not to each other, but they hooked up. They hooked up at a party and they decided to leave their spouses. Well, I can't say hooked up. It's going to get worse. All right. I'm not, if you're new here, I'm not politically correct. I don't say things that a polished speaker would say. Is that all right with you? So they hooked up. And they left their spouses for unbiblical reasons. And I just want to say to you this morning, if you left your spouse for unbiblical reasons and you come to me and say, God brought me this person, God will never give you someone else's wife. You hear me? John the Baptist comes up and tries to speak truth into Herod. But his response was that he wanted to kill John because he didn't want to listen to the truth. He didn't want to hear the truth, but because of his popularity, John the Baptist's popularity with the crowd, he, he feared him and decided to put him into jail so he would rot in death. But his partner in crime, Herodias, wasn't content with that. She wasn't satisfied with him simply being in prison. Oh, he listened, Herod listened to her, which is wise to listen to women, and put John in prison, but, his, but her anger and resentfulness towards him wouldn't stop. So she threw a party for her lover's birthday. Now notice I said her lover's birthday, not her new husband's birthday, because if you're reading the scripture, God refuses to call them husband and wife. Do you see that? He refuses to acknowledge her union, calling her his brother Philip's wife. 
which reminds me the courts may call someone husband and wife, but only God has the authority to define what marriage is. If it wasn't twisted enough, this is where the depravity and the wickedness of the human heart takes a steep drop into the depths of sin. She gets hair drunk and gets her daughter to come out and dance provocatively in front of Herod and his friends. For those who are not tracking, her daughter is actually his niece. It's disgusting. You want to make it more disgusting? She's only 12 years old at this point in time. She is a child. Herod gets, I'm going to, I got to clean this one up so my wife, he gets turned on. Then that's clean as I can get it. And he promises this young girl anything that she wants. And the girl didn't want anything. She just wanted to please her mother. So she goes to her mother and her mother says, ask for John the Baptist's head. And although Herod didn't want to, he couldn't go back on his oath. He feared the crowd, so he did what the girl asked. Sinful hearts are at the root of all of this church. In our community groups, we have a section of every lesson that talks about a sin to avoid. And I love when new people come to our community groups because we ask if there's a sin to avoid. They say all of them but we're specifically talking about the sins in the passage we're covering. And if you were to just look at the sins in the passage that we're covering this morning, you have infidelity, unbiblical divorce, incest, jealousy, spite, anger, revenge. It keeps going on and on, doesn't it, church? And before we cast stones at these two people and say we have to realize that several of us deal with some of the sins I just mentioned, or have dealt with them in the past. This is a picture of people who reject Christ and fail to let Christ reign in their hearts. So what do we take away from this passage this morning? Because when I, when I read the passage, when I, when I studied it and I listened to other sermons, everybody wants to talk about John and how courageous he is. But if you look at the text, this passage isn't about John, it's about sin in our lives. And so when I look at this, the first thing I want to take from verses 1 through 2 is that we all have a conscience. We all have a conscience. Although Herod wasn't a Jew and he didn't really care for their religion, he couldn't help but hear about the things that were going on with Jesus. There were too many miracles taking place that even the most non-religious people were hearing about the miracles that Jesus was doing. And in his ignorance, he wrongly attributed John the Baptist with Jesus. To be fair, Matthew has pointed out how many similarities there were between Jesus and John the Baptist, so you couldn't really blame him for not understanding. But really what was going on, his conscience was getting to him. When he heard all the miracles going on, his conscience started coming, and he couldn't think straight, and he thought that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead and was coming back to him for revenge. His conscience was troubling him so much that his wife, and his friends could not console him. You know, the voice of a conscience, while silent, speaks loudly in our minds. It can be a powerful voice of God for those who will listen or a tool for Satan for those who refuse to listen. Because I know the word doesn't return void. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to people in here this morning of things that you're doing in your life that do not honor God. We all have a bit of Herod and Herodias in us. And just because we're saved doesn't mean we don't still sin, church. We have to continually kill sin or sin will be killing us. And for those who don't know Jesus as Lord of their life, your sin will kill your soul. So we all have a conscience, but secondly, you can't kill your conscience. Herod wrongly thought of all of his actions were forgotten about the moment that he had John the Baptist killed. He could start a new slate, but the moment he heard about Jesus, all of his sins started rushing back. Otherwise, verses 3 through 12 doesn't really make any sense 
because these are things that are happened in the past. And what was happening was he started thinking about all the things that he had done. You ever gone to a place and it just brings up memories of the past, whether good or bad? Something reminds you of things, and unfortunately, a lot of places we go reminds us of a lot of hurt in our lives. I realize sometimes this pain was caused by others, but sometimes this is pain that's caused by ourselves. And we think to ourselves, what, what can we do? Can we run from it? Who's ever tried to run from your sin? Can we hide from it? Can we ignore it? As hard as we can, as hard as we try, it won't leave our minds, church. All of these things were flooding back into Herod's mind, and it was troubling him so much. And here he is, given another opportunity to receive the message. John the Baptist was proclaiming Christ. Now, Jesus was here. All he had to do was listen to the voice of Jesus and said he sat there, a troubled soul, stuck in his sin. So what can I do? What can I possibly do now? I got an idea. Why don't I kill Jesus? That's what it says in the text in Luke 12, 31, tells us that some Pharisees came and told Jesus, get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. Herod thought, that John the Baptist killing would deal and solve his sins, and now he thought that killing Jesus would take care of him as well. Church, you can't kill your conscience. That's not how the human soul works. I remember going on a golfing trip a few years ago. As a matter of fact, it's probably been 12 years ago down to Myrtle Beach, um, and there was a group of guys that went out. Um, I stayed at home reading the Bible because, you know, I don't go out party or anything like that but actually I played guitar I stayed at home played guitar and um and uh, and I I still suck at it um, but I I played guitar and the rest of the guys went out to the club to shack now some of you younger people have got a misunderstanding about what I just said <laughs> there is a dance that older people called shagging right and so it was very popular so they went down to shack and uh Man, I can't, so many things are going to be posted on Facebook about today. All right, so they went down to shack, and so the guy, the guy was shagging with his girl, and he turned around, and his wife's best friend was right there in front of him, 400 miles from where he lived. And he came back to the, came back to the condo and says, I better call my wife if she hasn't already found out. Church your sins will be found out. I don't care where you are in this world, you will eventually have to deal with your sins. You can't kill them. You can't run from them. So you, you see the, there are consequences. Thirdly, there's consequences for ignoring your conscience and ignoring the things that you're doing in your life. So we get wrapped up in our sin that we don't think about the consequences of our sin. We actually get busy sometimes trying to cover our tracks so that no one else finds out about our sin. I mean, Herod's mind is having a field day with him, and he's so fixated on that, he's not realizing what is actually happening and what has happened with his own sin. It's affected his own family. How do you think, how do you think family reunions went with Herod and Philip from that day forward? You think they were awkward if they even had them? There's no need for sin to tear apart two families, but that's what happened. You know that over 50% of all marriages end in divorce today? And you know that the, actually the number is the same whether or not you're a Christian or non-Christian. It just is. So therefore, there's a strong possibility that over half of you have had to deal with that pain in your life. Amen? You've experienced the hurts of divorce. You're trying to deal with the aftermath of that hurt. It might be new, or there might be reminders in your life that go that brings up this hurt. And if that is you, I strongly encourage you to take part and celebrate recovery. We're very blessed today that Pastor David Mayo decided to show up for church for once. Where are you at, Pastor David? <laughs> Stand up, David, so everybody can see you. They didn't get a chance to see you on Sundays over there, all right? He's waving back there. If you'd like to take part in our Celebrate Recovery, come see him after baptisms. It's a great way. Matter of fact, I don't know a better way to deal with the hurts in your life than going through Celebrate Recovery. 
There's a healing for your pain. And if you're hurt this morning and you're struggling, I'm telling you the only way to heal your hurts is Jesus. Nothing else will heal them. So don't try to deal with it on your own. There's too much pain in this world for you to try, try to try, handle it on your own. But it's not too much for Jesus. But I think the thing that really gets me about this passage is not only does it affect your family, it affects future generations. I mean, I could talk about the generational curse here. That is sins of your parents that affect you. I've had generations of alcoholism in my family, and I've paid for that. My, my kids have paid for that. I mean, it's been a battle. It's probably why I've got such a passion for those who struggle with addiction, probably because of the pain that I've seen in my own life and my grandparents' life. But yet, this passage is even more intimate than the generational curse. This text shows us a more immediate sin. That is a parent teaching their kids to sin. Do you see it here in the text? Herodias' daughter was named Salome. Do you think a 12-year-old girl really wanted to go out and dance provocatively in front of a group of old men? You think she wanted to do that? I mean, it's sickening. It's even more sickening that these men were turned on by this. It's even more sickening that her own mother would put her up to do this because of her hate and anger towards another man who just told her to do what was right. Her hatred for John, trying to keep them from going down this path, was apparently greater than her love for her own daughter, church. I mean, just look at it. But her daughter just wanted to please her mother, so she did it. Do you know how many kids just want to please their, their parents? I mean, they, they, they don't need more presents. They don't need more things to keep them busy. They need you in their life. They need you loving them. They need you being part of their lives. I can't imagine what this little girl was feeling as these men just said horrible things to her. Was it enough her, her, her mother got her daughter involved in killing an innocent man? I hope there's not a person in here that's not disgusted by this, but what are we teaching our kids? Are we teaching them the ways of the word or the ways of the world? Now, some of you are like, this isn't me. I would never do this. I would never do this. You ever gone to a place where children under a certain age get in for free? Children seven or under, are free, but eight are full price. My dad would always tell me I was seven years old. <laughs> Anybody else ever done that? Raise your hand, let's be honest. I can't be the only person in here. I mean, I was seven until I was 17. <laughs> and some people, you know, we laugh about it and we joke about it. And some, it's like, well, that's not the same thing as what Herodias does. Let me remind you that sin is sin. You hear me? And all sin separates us from a holy and righteous God. So what are we teaching our kids? I mean, she didn't know to please the father. She just wanted to please her mother. She just wanted the approval of the mother and she would do anything to garner her approval. There's so many kids that just want to feel loved. Man, um, the wards got a chance to see Brittany and Brian last night at the fix and, and they gave us a card. And uh, I read it, she gave me a card, and I read it, and um, I almost brought it out here to read to y'all, but there's an excerpt in that that I think is perfectly right here. She said, you remember when you found me on the streets of Kensington, and you asked me if I've ever been loved before? And you told me about the love of, of Jesus? I didn't understand it now. But now I finally, finally, after years of trying to find love in all the wrong places, I finally know what love is. And there's no love greater than the love of our heavenly father who loves us regardless of what we've done in our lives, what we've been through. And if you don't know this love that I'm talking about this morning, you can receive this love. Jesus is greater than any type of love you can ever find on this earth church. I, I just think about this girl. 
I think about the kids in Hopewell. I've gotten a chance this week to be with the kids in Hopewell and, 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 a, and from the elementary schools to the high schools. And these kids just want love. They just want love. That's what this girl wanted. But yet her own mother's teaching her to sin instead of teaching her how and loving her well. So I look at this consequences of our sin, but what are we to do here? So this is where, this is where the part that comes in, where, where John actually comes into this text. So we're talking about all the sin and being in a sinful world. We have to understand that there is a cost of following Christ, church. There's a cost of following Christ. We live in a world that is consistently rejecting Christ. And while we think sin is worse than it's ever been, this text shows us that sin has always been a problem. Social media is just making it more widely known and widely accepted. The sins that Herod, Herodias, and sadly their own daughter committed are all sins that are all around us today. So how are we to act as Christians in a world that is so broken? And the first thing is that we must be the visible light of Christ. We must be the visible light of Christ. See, people can't see Christ, but they can see you. The church has, this church has the unique blessing of having a strong presence in the community. Our mission statement is to shine the light of Christ into the darkest places of the well and beyond. There's not a place that we won't go to shine the light of Christ. And the blessings is we get to see miracles every single week. We don't get to see miracles occasionally. We get to see miracles daily, church. Don't ever take that for granted. This, this week on Wednesday, I was at Hopewell High School and I was talking to another pastor. And one of the things that burdens me out of many for our children and youth here is a lot of our children who come to this church in our community, they can't afford to do the things that other kids do. They don't get to go to camps. You know, so many kids will go to camps all over the place this year. But for a lot of our kids, $500, $600 for a camp is a pipe dream. So I said, you know what? We've got to have a camp that is, that is free. Do you agree? Like the kids can experience, the kids can experience what other kids get to do. We may not be able to take them to all these places and, and around the world, but we can, we can do something. And this church has always walked by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen? We've always done it. Offering plates, not too, you know, heavy, if you know what I mean. But we always trust God. And so you know what happened? Within five minutes of talking about this need, I get a text and I read it. And I'm not going to say who it's from. And it says, Pastor... I just bought a huge piece of land with dormitories and rivers and lakes, and I was wondering if you'd like to use it for your youth to go to camp for free. You, you can't. You can't make this stuff up, and especially the timing of it. And so we were just trying to be the visible light of Christ, and Christ takes care of the rest. And so we have, to, we have to stand up for Christ when we're out here. When John spoke to Herod about Herodias, he simply told the truth of the word of God. He didn't hold up a sign saying, repent. He simply told them the truth when he had the opportunity to tell them the truth. It would have been easy to ignore, but he held to his convictions and he told them the truth of God's word. And when we're out in the community, I'm not trying to change anybody. I can't change anybody. If you're here today and you're convicted, it's only because of the Holy Spirit that is working in your hearts right now. I can't change anyone, but the, the Jesus I preach can change everyone in here. And as we're out here and people ask us, I just open up the Bible and you, you point to the Bible. And part of standing up for Christ is being authentic with our own struggles with sin. You know, we try to hide like we have everything together and we're not. I mean, I, I, we're pretty authentic about that, right? 
But we're trying to teach lost people that, that they need to know that we're broken too, that we need Jesus too. We need every single day. We need Jesus every single day, every single hour, every single minute, every single second. We need Jesus in our own life. So we're, we're not doing a service to the community if we're telling them you need this because we need it too, church. It's one of the th reasons I love Way of the Master. It's one of the first evangelism classes I ever taught. It just goes through the Ten Commandments. And I tell them, have you ever told a lie? Who's ever told a lie in here? Me too. Who's ever stolen something in here? You're lying. You haven't raised your hand, you're lying. You steal from God every week, you don't tithe. You don't want me to get into that right now, do you? Have you ever looked at someone with lust? You know, when you, when you go through the Ten Commandments, not a single one of us can sit there and say that we're not guilty of the same thing that we're talking to someone else about. And that's the great thing about it. We're, we're all guilty. We all need Jesus. So we're not acting better than anybody else. We're just saying, I need Jesus just like you need Jesus. And the results, people are coming to know Jesus. You know, we're about to have, um, well, thirdly, let me do this. And I'm going to ask the, the Sean to come up and play God of the city. It's worth a shot. Um, be prepared to pay the cost of following Christ. You know, we don't, we don't see this in America here, but John, it cost him his life. And I just, I just read a story where someone said, you know, before they baptize somebody, they go, are you willing to, are you willing to give your life for Jesus before you get baptized? And in, in American church, we take it so, so easy and just like checking off the boxes. Like, what are you willing to do for Jesus? Because Jesus died for you. Like, are you willing to pay the cost of following Jesus? And part of the cost of following Jesus is to deal with the pride in your own heart right now. The sin that's going on in your life. The prayer team's gonna come up now. And even if you don't wanna confess your sins, although the Bible says to confess your sins to one another. But even if you don't want to deal with that, just say, you know what? I've got stuff in my life I need cleaned up. And let us pray for you. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will intercede with grumblings too deep for words. I don't need to know what it is. God knows. H.B. Charles says, in leaning over to reach the world, the church has fallen in. We have to deal with ourselves at this moment for us to go out and lovingly reach a broken world. I hope this has convicted you this morning. They're not all warm and fuzzy, but it's all needed. I know I've got things in my life that I need to clean up. Anybody else got a witness this morning? Not that I got to clean up things in my life, but you got to clean up things in your life. If you don't know Jesus, I'd encourage you to come and receive Jesus this morning. So I don't even know what that means, but come and receive Jesus, we'll, we'll tell you. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to respond. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for being a holy and righteous God, a God who loves us, who never leaves us or forsakes us. Lord, as people are coming, we're just, we just need you. Man, I'm tired of fake Christians. We don't need any more fake Christians. We need authentic Christians desiring to please a holy and righteous Savior. But we're broken people. We do broken things. So, Lord, we need to be healed from our hurts. We need to be healed from our sins. And only you can do that. Only you can restore our hearts. So, Lord, I pray this time of invitation, this time of response, Lord, we just be real with things that we're doing in our life that are not honoring you. And you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and respond to the word.